Innovation in Cloud Security podcast, episode number eight, I think, and episode 150 or 160 of um, the Virtualization Security podcast that we will be putting back out on iTunes, which will be the audio version of this. With me today is Mike Foley, a technical market, security technical marketing person at VMware covering vSphere specifically, right? That, that, yeah, that, that has all the buzzwords, just not in the right order. <laughs> what is the right order? <laughs> vSphere, uh, vSphere technical marketing, focusing on security. All the buzzwords are Of there. vSphere. On vSphere specifically. And Tyler Britton, did I say that right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Tyler, what do you do? So I do, I'm a technical marketing manager for uh, Blue Box, uh, which is a OpenStack private cloud provider that's part of IBM. Wonderful. So you work for the big blue. Yes. I did that once myself. So <laughs> I think everybody has. Nope. <laughs> no, you did the deck thing, and I've done that. So anyways, we want to continue the conversation that we started at um, on Twitter where we were talking about private and public cloud and hybrid cloud isolation requirements. And I know, Tyler, you're coming from the private cloud arena. Um, Mike and I are really coming from the hybrid cloud arena, I think is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. Because to be honest, in my definition, there is no such thing as a private cloud unless it happens to be inside of a, oh, a copper, a, a copper um, cave. Parity case. Parity <laughs> case. And the people have to go in by, uh, you know, by, by, by pass those people with guns. To me, that would be the only private cloud ever in the world. Okay. The reason being is, is once you access it from a public location, a la here, you are now in the public. So therefore, it's a hybrid environment. Uh, that's one. That's one way I think. I mean, I think generally the 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 definition we use is more around tenancy, right? So public cloud is a multi-tenant architecture from and a private cloud is a single tenant architecture. Um, I would disagree with you there. I think every yeah. single tenant. Yeah, I, well, I think I think the industry is agreeing with Tyler, so. <laughs> the industry also disagrees with Tyler if you're in the security world because there are multiple tenants inside of any tenant, a single tenant, for example. You got to keep HIPAA data away from PCI data. You cross those two boundaries, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Unless well, those are yeah. the the well. Let's think about this one: HIPAA data, doc, medical data, and payment card information. You can't cross those boundaries, or the fine that's going to hit your organization is huge. Yeah, well, I think at that point you're talking data. I wouldn't call them tenants. To me, tenants are more the people organization side. So let's say I'm a healthcare billing company, so I have PCI data and HIPAA data. If that division that does, let's say they handle both those pieces, they're a tenant. Now we have to deal with their data, you know, from a to, to your point, from an isolation perspective. But from a just pure tenancy perspective, it's one, you know, if Mike works for that group and he processes payments, he has a login to that entire environment. That's you know that's his role. He's part of that tenant, but he may touch multiple pieces of data that can't touch each other. Well, but also you may have a private firm that comes in, logs in, and does all your billing. That's a tenant, and then you have the doctors who are now con contractors working on in their individual room uh, hospitals and or practices, and they're tenants. Well, tenants, we, we could argue this all day long. <laughs> there are, to me, a tenant is not organizational. It is not even functional. It's based on security zone or trust zone. To me, that defines a tenancy. Um, I mean, I think to I think in in a private instances. So when we say like for me, a private cloud, we you know you're whatever this 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 theoretical company we're talking about you're our tenant you have a bunch of a bunch of instances running in what we treat you as one customer you're one tenant to us and you may subdivide that into more tenants because you have different parts of the business and and that's where it gets into user access roles and and, and things like that i think that's that's where, that's where i think that isolation is a requirement actually you have isolation in every cloud you build everybody does yeah well there's there's always some level you know the basic thing of like 
if you take Amazon, even on totally public instances, you have logical isolation. Like you don't know who's sharing those those Zen nodes with those Zen hypervisors with you. You don't know. Even inside your own tenancy, you have isolation. But the basic cloud is isolated because you isolate the management components of the cloud away from the tenant component of the cloud all the time. Sure. But you have to because you don't want the tenant users to go off and start spinning up and destroying your subsystem. So you keep those always separate. Management has always been kept separate. Whether it's inside of the hypervisor like vSphere, we always say, what's our mantra, Mike? <laughs> keep management separate? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is our mantra, keep management yes. separate. And it's the same yes. thing for the class. So that isolation has to be baked in. So why not allow other people to use that? Now, isolation is a tough word. I think it's more segregation and or separation. And that well, very few cases need true isolation, which means separate components and separate everything. Yeah, I think I think that's where people kind of go off the rails with it sometimes is, you know, especially when they say, hey, I want to build a, a multi-tenant environment, say even internally, you know, and they're like, well, I need separate. Does the storage array do multi -tenant? Like, well, why do I have to subdivide it? If, if my control point is, say, in VMware, at the vSphere level, and you can only see, and I make separate data stores, let's just say that, like, why does the storage array have to be multi-tenant also? You're not, it's totally abstracted from you. You don't even know it exists. You just consume data stores. Or if you take it the level above that, where they just see a data store pool, they don't even see it. And you can do things like storage IO control to limit noisy neighbor type stuff. That's where it starts to get into, to, to your point, like how separate do you need to be? I mean, obviously there's stuff that's, like uh, like NERC and everything that are very prescriptive about this is exactly has to be physically separate. But I think in a lot of cases, it's vague, so people assume the worst. It is, but I also think it depends on what you want to do with it. For example, if I want to do forensics in a cloud, <laughs> having segregation all the way down to the storage layer is actually not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do, but you have to design your cloud to be able to accept that. Sure. Well, I think it's safe to say that um, everyone's looking for the easy button on all of these types of questions, right? So they came up with the term multi-tenancy, but no one really sat down and tried to figure out what does that define. And multi-tenancy to me might be different to you, to you. It, it's, do, do you, do you, so in, in the, the, VMworld space of a few years ago, everyone was all bent out of shape about multi-tenancy, right? How do I make sure that Coke and Pepsi living on the same system don't interact with each other? And like Tyler said, there are ways to isolate those things. The, the abstraction layer alone isolates you from uh, Coke's VM being able to get at Pepsi's VM because you need to be in a different role, in a management role in order to affect that change. But that doesn't say anything about network isolation, right? Or it doesn't say anything about even management isolation, right? Do I have one management plane that only people who have been qualified to touch Coke stuff and not Pepsi stuff is completely isolated? So this is... It, it's discussions like this that always remind me of that Three Stooges skit where Curly is opening the artichoke, right? And he's going, and he's going, and he's going, and he just keeps going, and he never gets to what he thinks is the end. You can just keep going and going and going and go down to picking down to the nits at the x86 instruction level and still, start, still be using the term multi-tenancy. But at the end of the day, from a business standpoint, a business doesn't care. A business cares right? that it they care that Coke stuff can't be seen by Pepsi stuff and that we pass an audit. That is essentially, at the end of the day, what the business cares fine. about. You're, at the end of the day, you're not going to get fined for that massive law that <coughs> for mixing PCI and HIPAA data. Or for allowing yeah. PCI data to go out and PII to be found from HIPAA. Well, I in various other acronyms associated with regulate, regulatory compliance. 
ignoring regulatory compliance for a second, because you can always claim that, is think I, I think of it as a as a different way of defining a tenant. And I think we need to come up with what's the definition of a tenant because we all three of us can agree to it. Mine is regardless of organization in a in a single tenant cloud to me in a single organization cloud a private cloud i look at a tenant as being a trust owner always have that's i i think no i think that's fair and i think that's what i dislike about you know the usual um think about how when we talk about multi-tenancy in a private instance what are we always talking about accounting engineering these different groups are like whoa whoa, right. whoa what's why are we drawing those arbitrary lines just to say like business, we don't need to just because they're different organizations within the companies draw different lines. Now, in case of, hey, we may want um, a subset of the tier points to trust. We do VMware. You do, uh, you know, their source code. People actually touching the source code is a different trust zone than every other user yep. in the company kind of thing. Like that, that totally makes sense. And I think you, you, you may even have, oh, I don't know, maybe we'll call it a federation. And there are <laughs> unique business lines within that federation, some of which are legal separate entities, but not entirely quite legal separate entities. But from one, one regulatory stance, they are legally separated from another, they're not. So where is the multi-tenancy there? That's just hypothetical. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think it's it's... It's very, I think companies get caught in the <coughs> of um, over defining of over defining. And then also, you know, there's kind of that IT, just the natural motion of worst case, I'm going to get blamed worst case scenario. So let me, let me come with the biggest, most expensive, most corner case covered as long as they say, you know, get them. So then if they say no to any of it and anything happens, I can be like, well, if we just did this, then we wouldn't have had that problem. <laughs> Uh, kind of approach. Why, the, the reason why I do trust zones is actually comes from the vSphere hypervisor world where baked into every hypervisor is actually a, a minimum of four trust zones that have to stay segregated from each other. Not necessarily isolated because people use VLANs and things like that to do segregation, but they really should not be able to see each other. Mm -hmm. You know, once I once you take that example of okay, I, every hypervisor has these four built-in, baked-in trust zones, and one of them happens to be the virtual machines. Everything else is management, storage, and um, vMotion slash fault tolerance. All these things that no one should ever look at. That is a regular user, but inside the VM world, there are multiple different predefined trust zones that cross all sorts of organizational boundaries, such as a DMZ. Sure. Or a production, a, a um, development environment used by this agile group that crosses boundaries. So the whole engineering versus this versus that, I just don't like because in an agile world, there's no boundaries anyways. Yeah, and I mean, I think, I don't think they're there. I think it's one of those, it's like Contoso limited, right? It's just one of those lazy examples that, that people in, in tech marketing have used for years. So they just, it's it's a known quantity, so they just they just run with it kind of thing. I mean, think about when you're you know like Windows NT 4.0 setting up file shares. It's always set up a file share for engineering, one for accounting, one for marketing. Every you know for dummies book says the same thing. So I think a piece of that is that. I think that's why sometimes customers get stuck in navel gazing when it comes to isolation issues because they can't wrap their mind around it in those type of methodologies of like, well, what do you really need access to? You know, kind of. What stuff can we group by by trust? And then some of it's also just risk. You know, just as simple, you know, for someone you may say, hey, when you log in, this is your your access control. So when you log in as, as you, you can see this. When Mike logs in as him, he can see that. So for some people, they may say, well, technically they have access to the same login point. So if somehow I got Mike's credentials, I'd have access to that. So they need to be totally, you know, isolated on separate networks. And I think that's one of those risk risk versus uh risk versus overhead type discussions of you know that's a getting into the whole turning off transparent memory sh uh sharing in vSphere like the amount of people who really need to turn that off that that's really a problem versus people just freaking out and turning it off 
You know, you see that we say that all the time with stuff. Only required if you have a, a, a very large car. Well, no, I mean, with perfect... multiple trust zones where you really can't afford that. Can't hear you, Mike. <laughs> a very overcommitted server. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Right. And most servers, servers aren't, aren't seriously, seriously overcommitted. Yeah. Exactly. And the solution could be buy more servers. Yeah. But think... but but Tyler's right. It. It, I think one of the things a lot of people just don't understand is how to have a discussion around risk management because security rules are yes or no. Invariably, 99% of the time, it's no, right? The, the setting has to be that way. Yeah, but we never even use that code. The setting has to be that way. So uh, it, there's, there's rarely logic involved it's in many cases i believe a lot of it is emotion which is driven by people basically afraid of losing their gig right um we keep on going back to this one it's like you know if you're looking at a hardening guide and saying it must be like x then you're not using it as a guide you're using it as the the end the end all and that's just the wrong right and so which which you just proved my point they don't know how to have a discussion around risk management. So, you know, the TPS thing is, is a good example. Um, is there a technical possibility that if you have two VM, uh, if you have multiple VMs on a seriously overcommitted server that you could possibly maybe, you know, doing this sort of thing, possibly gleam some information? Yeah. But... You you need you really need to have the stars aligned, and well, you need to have you need to have sensitive let's data. Over, let's, not those over, VMs. let's not overcomplicate this one. We both know, and we all three of us know, attackers are patient enough to wait for the stars to align. Sure. Yeah, but but I think I think the to to Mike's point, to me, almost a hardening guide shouldn't have a suggested setting. For this, it'd be like, here's these, like, so let's say you're building a, a hardening guide from scratch, and it says this thing, SSH, remote SSH enabled, consequences of enabling it, this is this, this is this, and just, and just passing information, because then that forces the security person to go, well, do we care about that? Is that a problem? Is that something we're concerned with? But they won't. They'll go back and say, where's the setting? What do I need to make it? Exactly. Because it's right. more than just that. Because, just because the... most security guys today, and I'm sorry, security guys, again, uh, most security guys today, their job is to run Nessus and check for compliance. Yep. They are not involved in a risk management discussion a risk management discussion directly that directly affects the business. Their job is to run scans, print out reports, get people to be compliant to those reports. So don't you think the vendors are... are great gig if you can get it. Well, don't you think vendors are, we're as a, as a group kind of complicit, especially security vendors in that, from the standpoint of continuing that feedback loop of, you're afraid of this thing, we make, we sell this thing that you really need to have so you don't have to deal with that thing and do tons of advertising so the CIO sees, hey, do we have a thing that does this? Because they're saying that you know the Russian hackers are gonna hack us. We don't buy one of these things. And then right. from from a you know fiefdom perspective, to your point, Mike, I'm a security guy, what do you mean? Like, yes, I need more money for my budget to buy that thing. I want I want more stuff. Right? And and it just ends up that that continuous cycle. So okay, if we can agree that trust zone is a definition of a a fairly good definition of a tenant. Mm-hmm. That implies that all clouds, regardless of public, private, or hybrid, are multi-tenanted. Fair. And yeah, and that is required all the way through the environment at whatever the risk levels say there should be. So let's look at those risk levels. Let's talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do I need segregation, isolation all the way down to the server level? Probably not. No. No, definitely not. <laughs> well, or most likely. It, it, probably not unless the data that you're actually having in those trust zones absolutely should be kept separate. Well, so, but that, it's, it's a size issue more than it is a, it's a size performance issue more than it is a virtual machine versus hypervisor versus everything. 
Yeah, but that that's that to me that keeps separate is vague. A perfect, you know, what kind of what started this conversation when find we're, separate exactly was when we're on Twitter. isolated on separate hardware. Well, it is uh, you know started this on Twitter was the whole which I I did a blog post on the companies pushing um, VM level encryption in the cloud, especially public cloud. Oh, you have to encrypt. You have to encrypt to protect your data. PCI compliance was the one you see all the time. And like, oh, if you're running an Amazon, well, well. Amazon actually is PCI compliant out of the box. So I don't need your thing besides getting into the fact of is your thing really doing actually, protecting me from the risk that you're saying it is, but Amazon is not PCI compliant out of a box. A part of Amazon is PCI compliant, not all of it. If you run its level 1 makes no difference. Oh. They a, a PCI or any regulatory compliance is all about scope. They yep. did not scope in the entire of Amazon. I'll guarantee you that. They took a small subset of it and said, this component is PCI compliant. Well, <laughs> these servers here, in this these not. servers in this cage are PCI compliant. Exactly. So regulatory compliance is about scope. So by saying all of Amazon is PCI compliant, I can't believe it. Uh, it's So there's it's at the service level, but all of EC2... Um, there's a list. It's it's. I was blown away by the amount that's in scope for them. Well, so that means that you, they must have like four four hundred QSAs going through and scanning it and doing every whatever they do every four hours. Well, you know, everything's automated. That's that's why it's do it. If you're running a cloud with hundreds of thousands of servers in it, everything's automated. Is the only way you can do it. So everything is automated for every process. It's actually easier than the mom and pop shop with a hundred. Yeah, you don't need 400 QSAs. You need one QSA that knows how to write code. <laughs> That's right, but you also need a QSA to review all the results because a computer cannot act as a QSA today. Again, I think it's a scope issue. I think that what's in scope is a small subset of everything. And the thing is, is that do you need encryption, VM level encryption in Amazon? Well, they provide it. No, I'm saying I'm bringing your well, thing. Th then the, the question then becomes is, okay, who's managing the keys? Well, then you can get an HSM and that store your own keys, but they still have the master key. Well, yeah, that goes back to the get key. any other key out of it. Well, and also the, the point depends of, on how it's implemented. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that was the point of the, the post that I put up was the if you're bringing BYO, you know, BYOE, bringing your own encryption um, with BitLocker or something like that to Amazon. Who you really if the machine's up and running and it gets compromised, it's like the encryption's not even there, right? It's at rest encryption, and I'm not protecting myself from Amazon's admins because they can just like with vSphere right now. If I'm a vSphere admin and one of my groups says we need to protect ourselves from administrators, so we're going to run BitLocker inside our VMs. I, as a vSphere administrator, can snapshot that VM, grab its memory, get the key, unlock the disk, no big deal. Like it's it's trivial. Well, Can't run BitLocker in a vSphere VM, but whatever. <laughs> This is it news, and it's no, the in, in VM encryption has that weakness. Sure. VM well, then, encryption with inside the hypervisor, however, has different weaknesses. VM encryption at the disk level or the virtual disk level or anything down in that storage stack, depending on where you are, once you read through it, it's unencrypted. So if if my goal is to do encryption at rest, that's easy. Anybody yeah. can do that. If my goal is to protect the data from Amazon admins or the vSphere admin or anybody that Hyper-V's admin or Azure's admin, that's harder. Yeah. Well, I, th I think that's the, the, the old adage of, right, if, if, if you have physical access, you have to eventually assume it's compromised, right? Well, uh, that's, that's changing. If you look at some of the new stuff out of Intel, when what is it um what's the next release that's coming out mike with all the new new encryption stuff braswell no haswell's already out no braswell that's braswell that's a, broadmoor broadmoor Broad, one like sound something like, like an island that's after that <laughs> yeah Sunfire. some harry potter thing yeah. yeah anyways when that comes out when sgx and all the atomic level encryption the the encrypted cache or the encrypted um, enclave is available, storing keys in that's going to be incredibly important. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it goes back to, you know, as we, as we started, is it's a whole risk 
that it's not right now is when it comes to isolation. You said, what's enough isolation? You know, is what what's our risk level? What are we trying to avoid? What are we trying to prevent? And then we get the level of isolation that's sufficient. It could be as simple as, hey, they're on a separate network, they have a separate virtual network, they're on a separate physical network, they're on separate physical servers. They're, you know, all those things, how far down the stack you have to go is it should be the 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 easiest at the most logical level before you start moving down the stack because that's the easiest to to manage and administer. I would agree. Well, I think um, I think one of the things we have to take into consideration is what are the business drivers, right? Because we can sit here and come up with the coolest, neatest, awesomest tech, right? All of that stuff that Intel is, is putting in their chips. But if a customer says, if a customer doesn't say, I will buy that, no one's going to code to it, right? Um, when you think of it from a product manager standpoint, what, what incentive is it to add that to something if you have no customers that will say they'll buy it? That's just, that's just product management reality. Sure. So well, the other reality is that as a business that may be looking to buy this, I need a business driver to even start looking in that area. And the reason why everybody's looking at encryption right now is because of all the breaches like OPM and those guys. And no, the reason why the reason why people are looking at encryption right now is because it is a requirement of a number of different audit standards. Yep. Right? It is a requirement that if you are running PCI, thou must encrypt. It's also a requirement of HIPAA if thou are doing HIPAA. Yeah. Data, so it's not a, it's not a boy. I'd really like to have that. It is a checkbox. But at the same and time, that is what is that is what drives the vast majority of features. Yeah, but I think I think it's it's at a certain level because let's I mean to your point, let's Target's a perfect example. Once the dust finally settled in the whole Target thing, it basically cost them effectively nothing. If you add up all the fines bad publicity, stuff they gave away, but they added up when you looked at the the next quarterly report after that, it was a couple million, it was, it was a man. couple hours worth of, of revenue. It was nothing in right. the grand scheme of things. So where's the real business driver, you know, to do more than the bare minimum because who cares if you're right. Target. Now, if you're a little mom and pop shop, you probably can't survive it, but the Target right. or Home Depot, they just chug right along. Yeah, you're too big to fail. Well, and other things is people start voting with their feet with Target and Home Depot. To be honest, they've started going elsewhere. But the, their their their, their their quarterly earnings show that people aren't doing that because they they don't they have a target that's their choice. The but for the next ten miles or whatever, they're not going to drive further because they don't have you know unless they want to go to Walmart, which they generally don't want to either. Especially once you have basically every big box retailer with some sort of breach, you're going to have no place left to shop. Yeah. But people, I mean, I, my family and I, I and my family, we do vote with our feet quite a lot. We don't you are the exception to the rule, Edward. Well, right? I've always when, been... <laughs> when, when, you live, when you live out in the boonies like I do, and the closest big, big store is three miles down the road, and it's a Walmart, and if something bad happened with them, am I going to turn around and drive 35 minutes to Target? Probably not. Because I'm going to assume, as a as a knowledgeable customer, they'll fix it. Well, and I don't shop at Walmart. I'm not liable because I because I'm using a credit card. I'm not liable for anything more than fifty bucks. Not, so not anymore. That's changed. no, no, it's still no transfer liability does not affect is not to the consumer yet. Yeah, Actually, the transfer of liability has has moved from the credit card bureaus. To the banks if, until until they implement chip and pin, and then it goes not to the consumer; it goes to the the merchant. The merchant. If the last step is, which is what they have a lot of places, <laughs> use, is it does go to the consumer. If you use the chip and you put your pin in, they it's on you, and you say, "Oh, that's a fraudulent transaction." So I actually like it the way it is because I have no problems. Oh, Target, you're, you're it's a, it's a slight annoyance to get a new card. But it's not my money that's that's at stolen. risk. No, yeah, that's changing now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it is. Once that once it gets to that point where it is my money, then I then I will care yeah. more. But it's also a lot harder than you know stealing some uh, magnetic stripe data. 
Yeah, what someone said to me the other day, well, you're a security guy. And it's like, well, yeah, I live and breathe it. I work in this industry, but I'm thinking about how do I protect myself? How do I protect my family? And that translates to what I am expecting out of a cloud, out of, out of any service, whether it's a SaaS service, a cloud service, infrastructure service, my bank, or even my the stores I work I go shop at, if they don't treat my data respectfully or request things that they legally don't require, take this as a compliment, Edward. You are an aberration, <laughs> right? Well, you. you you are not representative of ninety eight percent of the people in this country. I would agree with you, and and it's taken me a long way to get to this point where. I w would rather vote with my feet, but I also vote on clouds with my feet. I'm actually trying to get out of one cloud because of the way it's treating me and its performance and a bunch of other stuff. Which cloud will I go into? I haven't decided yet. Yeah, There's I'm. I'm. Problem. I'm. I've been slowly moving stuff out of cloud-based services because I don't know if they're going to be there tomorrow. Some of them will be there, but they charge an arm and a leg. You know, right. Well, I mean, I, I had I had a really interesting discussion with uh, with Jay Metz uh, a few weeks ago when I was out in California and we were talking about, you know, we, we're both fans of Synology NASes mm -hmm. and I'm slowly moving a lot of my stuff to a Synology NAS that I bought. I'm looking to buy another one, putting it out here in the shed quarters and doing a backup from the one in the house to the one in the shed quarters. And then I was talking with with Jay about maybe he could send me a Synology NAS and I send him one because we trust each other not to go dicking around in our in our own stuff and we can encrypt the data. And he becomes my West Coast backup site. What? And if, what? if the shed and the house burn down, I say, put it in the box and FedEx it to me. And I have my data. And, and I've actually been doing something very similar myself because I've been using Synology for years. Um, but when VM, uh, not VMware, when um, Apple, as I use Apple devices, when Apple just say, said everybody, you can only sync through iCloud, I set up an own cloud inside my Synology, actually inside of a VM running on vSphere who's backed by the Synology. Yeah. That now all my data for calendar and um, my my calendar, my ma contacts, con calendar and contacts and everything and photos and everything is all synced through own cloud and or the directly to the Synology. That way, I don't have to touch iCloud except to find my iPhone. Yep. And that's just purely as an investment. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I so I why not? I do so I do like something similar, but instead of using because I used to use QNAP and I I moved, uh, um, end up doing uh, just Crash Plan, Crash Plan because it's encrypted and Crash Plan Cloud is actually relatively reasonable to back up to, and um, you know, to, like you said, going through a risk factor of the the crash plan encryption setup, you know, the, the encryption itself won't be compromised, but however they're, they're, they're handling it. Um, Cause I have to put my key in to access it when I try and do restores, but you know, that's the piece that gets, that's compromised. I, to me, that's a low enough risk for me that. Yeah. For the, after, after reading, after reading Jay Metz article on uh, where he actually did the math around backing up to the cloud, it, he found that, once you reach a certain amount of data, it's just cheaper to buy another Synology and put it somewhere else. He's, you're absolutely right. And the, the other thing is, is there's certain things you can't put up into the cloud for various, again, compliance reasons or legal reasons or other reasons. Yeah, but I said, so my, my biggest challenge, so from coming from, so when I was in IT, uh, we were publicly traded, and the only HIPAA type data we had was HR, right? We weren't, we were industrial services, but we were, we dealt with SOCs, uh, and it kind of, it is what, it, it kind of is what it is, kind of thing. Controls, compensating controls, all that. Some of this stuff was weird and annoying. And the big eye opener for me was I went to go work for an integrator and start working with a lot of different customers, is because 
Now, there's exceptions. Some of the rules are extremely prescriptive. Many of them are incredibly vague. Yes. And because of that, companies interpret them very differently. And what you generally see is because it's it's being afraid of being blamed for something, people in security and audit, in, even internally, um, interpret it in a more serious or difficult way just to play it, quote, play it safe kind of thing. So you see these really aggressive policies and methodology where people protecting and when you really get under the covers of it there's actually if you read the statute or you read the rules it doesn't apply now i'm going back to you know going back to the i just actually just pulled out if you go to if you just google amazon uh pci dss they have their statement on it it's basically 30 different amazon services out of east west GovCloud, Frankfurt, Ireland, Singapore, Tokyo, Sydney, Sao Paulo, PCI DSS level one compliant, and not and just EC2. Those specific services, as long as the audits are still kept on continuing and are done, it's a whole bunch of gotchas with that. Yeah, but so so my point my point being though is, you have people that are under the assumption that they need to go buy some other company's encryption product to be able to run a PCI compliant workload on Amazon. No. That's not the case. Well, that means they just haven't read. And the, well, the biggest problem with a lot of these clouds and Amazon, Amazon's changing. In the last two years, they've done some major changes to embed more transparency into their environment. Publishing these reports, publishing other things, allowing you to get access to things. Amazon's made a great some great headways there. Without that transparency, I had no clue what they were doing on my behalf because most clouds, and let's not just pick on Amazon, let's just say most clouds do not have a level of transparency that tell me what they're doing in an auditable form mm -hmm. is the key. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell, and therefore if I can't tell, I have to do it myself. Yep. Well, that, I mean, that. so our customers that are financial services customers, the reason they've come to us is because they each get their own stuff from a hardware perspective. Yeah. So we do, you know, back to the isolation question, our, each of our customers has their whole own separate hardware. So they get dedicated physical firewalls and then the physical servers are for them and them alone. So if we have, you know, in the same data center, we have 50 customers, there's 50 different environments basically uh, from a physical level. Um, obviously, at some point, the networking starts getting shared as you go as you go up the stack, unless they have a dedicated line dropped in. But that, you know, to your point, there's a lot of policies and and stuff that we have, you know, around. Here's how we manage it. At some point, you're letting someone else manage your stuff. You have to trust them, right? But you have to you want to see that their policies meet, you know, the way we do. Obviously, two factor authentication. Um, you know, we use Bastion hosts that log everything that's done on any of the customer environments. With that's proper... all part of the SLA. Exactly. So that's that's the expectation the customer has, and that's why they want. To your point, um, what I think, um, I think right now private clouds are, have that advantage, whether it's internal or you know a provider like us is. You can turn some more of those knobs and and get more visibility. But to your point, I think public cloud, um, public clouds are getting much more transparent in that area and much more advanced. Only the bigger ones. The smaller ones are still kind of narrowly focused. Well, I mean, and long term, like I, don't, I don't think the smaller ones are going to exist, right? With the exception of industry specific siloed clouds, like if you were a healthcare cloud or something like that. But I think you know if you're trying to build a generic IaaS cloud now you're you're gener you're wasting your time right if you're not because if you're not Google Amazon I mean if you look at how far behind Amazon Google and uh, and Microsoft are and they're gigantic you know and you're gonna be some some small shop up in nowheresville and and build an IaaS cloud and compete with Amazon it's it's gonna be tough well, actually, I think there's a rising um, growth of people that claim to be uh, managed service providers, which are managing those smaller groups, and they end up managing the cloud instances or set up their own. This, I, I mean, what you were talking about is like a banking cloud or whatnot, or a healthcare cloud. That's more of community clouds. Those mm -hmm. still exist. Sure. They're going to grow. I'd see yeah. a lot more of those. 
coming out. And I think those community clouds will be fine. But again, people who build community clouds need to realize that they still are multi-tenant. There's a certain level of segregation required, but not a huge amount because the community's there to share that data. Yeah. Well, and I, th- and I think the, and I, to your point, I think what you're going to start to see is a lot of people building stuff on top of, they'll see an Amazon or a Google as generic compute and build their own services, their own offerings on top of that, just because they won't be able to compete from a cost perspective. They'll do it initially, and then after that, they'll consider whether or not the expense is worth it. And they may end up having to go. I mean, there's a number of companies that started out on Amazon are now no longer there because of the cost. Sure. No, I mean, we 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 have a number of customers in that in that bucket from the standpoint of, it's to me, it's about utilization. Um, the big advantage of, of an Amazon is something you don't you're paying by the hour. I mean, you you're not wasting any resources. Uh, if you're buying gear, there's potential for wasted resources. So it's the I mean, pretty much if you can run your gear at close to 100 percent, you're going to you're going to be coming out ahead financially. It's just that most people they're not even running their old gear anywhere near that. Yeah, well, yeah it I, I, depends I, on how it depends on how you use the gear in, in general and how you maintain it. There's a whole lot of things involved there. I mean, people ask me, so why didn't you buy it, scale out instead of scaling up? And it's like, because I have headroom. And I design these things to have headroom so that I can spend, you know, six grand to buy more memory instead of spending 10 grand on a more box. And sure. that way I get more headroom. I can use more of that CPU, more of that memory, and really boost my systems up to a higher level of utilization. And I think you're going to see people making those decisions now as they grow to be, do I go to a cloud? Do I do this? And, and the whole comment about encryption is that literally you could do today an infrastructure as a service where all you do is encrypt everything and the different encryption keys define the tenant. Sure. No, I mean, to me, that's... So everything's shared except that it's shared, even the networking is encrypted. So everything is shared but segregated by different encryption keys. I mean, basically, if you that's what if you, the internet's filled with, or even you know, the internet's filled with VPN tunnels. I mean, it's a, you know, if there's if there's a ton of VPN tunnels running all over the internet, that's basically you know, they're sharing the wires, but you know, they're they're quote segregated. And they're segregated enough to meet most. Actually, I don't. I think they're segregated enough to meet just about everything I've ever heard of. Mm-hmm. Right. But this whole push to to encrypt everything. It's worrisome because, A, I don't think we need to. I think the other thing we need to do is think about digitally signing everything, <laughs> yes. Encrypting everything, no, because it's, it's public information. I shouldn't need your encryption key to go read a website today. Yeah. The no, I... may be encrypted with SSL, but the data is not. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's, a, I think it's an interesting place because... It's a knee jerk. I think we were much more uh, careful with it before with the the processing overhead, whereas now it's like, oh, the processors are big and fast, and there's even special some of them have specialized circuits to do. We have we have specialized circuits. That let's just encrypt everything. And it's like, well, especially to your point, if it's all encrypted one way, it's what's the difference? Why are we doing this? You know, what what's our real outcome here? We're trying to achieve, and that's why to me, data at rest encryption is like fantastic on my laptop. I love it. Um, you know, for, for use cases like that, or if I have a big storage array and I'm really concerned about, you know, when I throw the drives away, if they're bad, you know, with, with data on them type of thing. But a lot of these use cases for data at rest encryption are what's, what's the, what am I really preventing? What am I really protecting? And are we just going overboard and managing all these keys and, and rest? Yeah, enc- actually, data at rest encryption is not going overboard. And the reason being is, is that unless Amazon can prove a destruction of a disk, which they can then it won't make a difference. But you got to first prove I have my data on it in the first place. Okay. Again, transparency. If I don't sure. know they're doing it, I got to do it because why? It could end up in Africa and somebody could be sucking the data off of it. Sure. But if you see, there used to be on eBay drives going, small 100 gig drives going for $1,200. I guarantee you it had something juicy on it. Mm-hmm. So when you think about this, that's what it's trying to prevent. Data, data at rest encryption, no matter how you're doing it, as long as the keys are not on the controller, is not a bad thing. In VM encryption, on the other hand, 
I'm not sure is a good thing. You, you, you're not, all it gives you is data at rest encryption. It doesn't give you, it gives you a higher level of data at rest. In other words, at the storage layer, then I got the, the switch layer, then I got the HPA layer, then I got the kernel layer, and then I got the VM. If I can encrypt anywhere below the stack, it's encrypted all the way through the storage layer. So if I'm in the hypervisor or in the VM doing encryption, all it means is that the hypervisor sees, generically, generally sees only encrypted data and things like that. Could a good admin get access to it? Absolutely, if you give them the access to that information. You can I think we're going to have to wrap up here. We've. But I think what it boils down to is all you, I mean, if you're going to do this, you need to have the proper role-based access controls. You have to have the proper monitoring. Yeah, it's not just encryption. It's not yeah. just encryption. That's that's just one part of a much bigger story. Yep. And you're going to isolate, and you're going to segregate, you're going to isolate or segregate or separate traffic of all sorts, from users, from data to data, and all that, based on the application requirements. And as Mike keeps on pointing out, you know, it's based on the business requirements. Yeah. Sure. And I don't even know if the business requirements even think security is part of it. That's the big problem. So with that, any other I, know last I know Tyler has to go. Yeah. You have a last <laughs> thought, guys? Go ahead, Tyler. Um, my last thought would just be, yeah, I hope people are, let's start with the business, with anything, forget just security, but just IT in general. Let's start with the business requirements and work down versus starting with some piece of technology and working up. Yep. I agree with that. Me too. Thank you for being on the Virtualization Cloud Security video podcast.